Uh, you know what, folks, the goal here is not to complain that they close off the roads, but to understand that we have a part in ministering to our community. And so we had, it was great to have young people there. Thank you so much, Cody, for organizing that. Thank you to all the young people who took a part in that. We really appreciate it. Uh, thank you. It's our privilege today to have Martine Kelsey and her husband, uh, Justin, with us. Uh, Justin, you might know Justin, he uh, worked with Harvest House for quite a while, and uh, Justin was our connection point for having Harvest House come here. He's no longer at Harvest House, but uh, we still know him through that, and so we're so grateful to have him here today. And his wife is a, a very well-known uh, music artist, has won awards, uh, the East Coast Music Awards, uh, through the Gospel Music, and so we appreciated her being here today. They just got finished on the 150 tour across Canada with the 60-some churches. Uh, is that right? In, in the last little while? What's that? 60 different dates. Uh, 60 different dates. Yeah, yeah fantastic. Across the country. And so uh, we're privileged that they live in Moncton and that she's here with us today to be able to lead us in worship. And so she's going to do that in just a moment. But I can't have her lead in worship to a group of people who aren't quite awake yet. So what I need you to do is stand up and I want you to turn to somebody and I want you to look at them. And I have to hear you say this. You have to look at them and say, you look Beautiful. Okay?
This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. If I speak in tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging silence symbol. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor, and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Let no debt remain outstanding, except the continued debt to love one another. For whoever loves others, has fulfilled the law, the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not cover it. And whatever other command there may be, are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does not harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is a fulfillment. Of the <coughs> we who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and uplift ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good. To build them up, for even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insult of them. Who is up to you? Have fallen on me. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of the mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had. So that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Doran and folks from our team. Give them all a round of applause. Thank you.
actually in Atlanta, Canada. And we try to do something to please God. You know, imagine God is interested in your life. God wants to do something with you. God wants to do something with you. Imagine. Imagine. God wants to do something with you. God has a plan for you. How old are you now? How old are you now? Four? Wow. And that means you only got another 14 years before you get to age. Right? Huh? You are five, are you? Oh, wow. So, so you're growing, hey? You're growing. Look, look, look. These kids over here, they're growing up a lot more than you guys, but you're all growing. And, <laughs> and God has something in mind for you. That's cool. I love that. Kids communicate well, don't they? Huh? That's right. God has something, and God is your father, and he wants to talk to you. And that's why we have this time for you kids in the morning. It's so that God can talk to you, and you can talk to God. You can read the Bible. God has written a book for you. God has a special book for you. So you'll grow up and become strong. Now, we want to pray for you this morning. I actually want to ask the prayer to do with the praying, but we're going to pray with you, and you'll repeat it after, and you don't talk to for us, talk to God, eh? Hey? You're going to talk to God now. Okay, pray. Should we ask help from the adults? Yes? Okay, so everybody? Yes, so if you close your eyes, put your hands together just to keep, concentrate, and repeat after me. Lord God, <coughs> help me this morning to get closer to you. Speak to my heart. Help me grow to become your servant. Make me wise. Lead me, lead me into your will. In Jesus' name, amen. And have a great lesson. God bless.
for being here with us and leading us in worship this morning. It has been a joy to be able to sing along with you the praises to our Lord and to have you worship or lead us in worship today. And we look forward to uh, you helping us conclude the service in a few moments. Are you happy to be at church? I, I see all the Baptists. You know two things about Baptists? If you have an event other than church on Sunday morning and you don't eat, they will ask you where the food is. And if you have church and you don't take up the offering where it normally is taken up, they will start waving their envelopes. Thank you for the reminder. I'm going to invite the ushers actually to come down and take up the morning offering. Um, I, I, was, I was reminded of a story, actually, about a family who didn't go to church hardly ever, and they had a new young fellow, and it, thank you, Ben, go right ahead and take up the offering this morning, um, start with the plates and go right ahead. Uh, and they were, they were coming to church, and uh, they had had this new baby, and so he grew up to be four or five years old, and they hadn't been to church yet. And so they said, you know, it's probably time to take young Johnny back to church. And so they came to church, and as they're coming up the stairs, Johnny grabbed his mom's coattail, and he said, Mom, Mom, Dad, you have the tickets. <laughs> and they said, oh, we don't need tickets here. And he thought that was kind of strange. So he came to church, sat down, the whole service went on. They had music, really good music. And Johnny tapped his toes and wanted to clap his hands. And, and he felt really good about it. And then they had this guy get up, and, and he was a really good speaker. He had visuals behind him, so Johnny wasn't even bored. And they actually had little things they could color on and everything else. And, Johnny thought this was a great place. It was almost better than the movie theater. And then somewhere along the line, they took this plate and they passed it around. And as Johnny was coming out of the door, he looked at his mom and his dad. And he said, Dad, Mom, he said, I know now why they don't have tickets. They wait for you to see the show before you have to pay. <laughs> well, we're not giving you a show. But we do hope that we speak to your hearts. If God has blessed you in some way, we thank you for giving to be able to help the ministry of Highfield Baptist Church to continue. <coughs> it is a blessing to serve the Lord in this way. The last number of weeks, we've been talking about our new purpose and our new motto. Love God, love people. Love God, love people. We talked about the fact that we as a church are reshaping a little bit. We're, we're, we're kind of molding and morphing into something new. And frankly, that's always what has to happen. It's a regular occurrence in the life of a believer and in the fellowship of God's people that we have to mold and shape into whatever it is that God wants us to do at the time. It doesn't mean that His truth changes. But it does mean that how we proceed about sharing that truth and how we interact sometimes does. Our new mission statement is through our faith in God and the work of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit, we exist to love God through Bible-centered worship, spirit-filled preaching, and practical teaching. Furthermore, we exist to love people through close fellowship, through compassionate ministry, and with a passion for evangelism. When Jesus was asked what was the most important thing in all the earth and most important law, he quotes in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. We exist to love God. In John chapter 1, or sorry, 1 John chapter 4, verse 19 says, We love him because he first, what? Loved us. As a church, we are called to demonstrate our love to God. And we do it through Bible-centered worship. In John 14, verse 15, it says, If you love me, what? Keep my commandments. We're called to love God, and we demonstrate it not just through Bible-centered worship, but also spirit-filled preaching. In John chapter 4, verse 24, it says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And we worship the Lord and show our love for Him through practical teaching. John 21, verse 7, it says, uh, Jesus said to him, Peter, feed my sheep. So now we have an idea about what the first part of love God means for the church I feel about. Now we need to talk about what? About the second part. Love God, love people. 
We are called to love people. You know, it's so much easier to love God than it is to love people. <laughs> it really is. Do you know what? I, one of the things I loved about today, and, and, and I love about really what's becoming a custom of, of, of Highfield, is that every week we see people here that are young in age. We see people who are, are older in age, story Claire and Bruce, older in age. We see people who are uh, not a Caucasian, you know, regular, have been in North America and Moncton and Atlanta, Canada all their life. Lots of different colors. Wow, I just sit there sometimes and I say, this is what heaven's going to be like. Amen. Wait until we have a Christmas celebration and Renita does another Christmas dance with a number of the young people from the church so we can celebrate a little bit of her culture here in Canada. It's a great thing to be a part of God's people. Love people. Wow. A new commandment says John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35, that I give to you, love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this will all know, you all know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. Matthew 5, 44 says, But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those that curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That's easier said than done, isn't it? There are many ways in which an individual might show somebody else that you love them. But there are three key ways that I believe that we as a church ought to show others that we love one another. And the first one is close fellowship. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 1 to 5, it says, Therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any fellowship, or, or sorry, if any uh, comfort in love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, uh, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in loneliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also on in the interests of others. Folks, if we're going to love other people the way that God wants us to love other people, one of the things that must characterize our love is a close sense of fellowship. The second is compassionate ministry. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24. <laughs> Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let, not, let us not forget or neglect the meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his returning is drawing near. If we're going to demonstrate love to other people, we must have close fellowship, we must have a compassionate sense of ministry, and thirdly, we must be passionate about evangelism. Matthew 28, 19 and 20 says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations. It's a great commission. You know it. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching these new disciples to obey all the commands that I have given to you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. At Highfield Baptist Church, we need to love people through close fellowship. The verse I read just a moment ago, the word if is part in it, it's translated in translation, it's actually the first class conditions of the Greek. And instead of the word if as being an uncertainty, the word if in this case actually means a certainty. It's like using the word since. And so we can say it this way. Since there is encouragement from belonging to Christ. Since there is comfort from his love. Since there is fellowship together in the spirit. Then are your hearts tender and compassionate. Then make you truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other. Loving one another. And working together with one mind and one purpose. Let's draw out the idea here a little bit. Close fellowship means that we know what it is to belong to Christ and to one another. It's significant in Scripture that when we come to become, uh, the place where we are birthed, when we come to the new birth, when we actually accept Christ our Lord and Savior, and we are born through the Spirit into God's kingdom, that we are not born individually as, a, as, as one child. God's family is not a one-child family. 
But we actually come into a family that has multiple children, and we come part of everybody in the family. So you're my sibling, whether you like it or not. Huh? So next time somebody looks at you and says, do you have any siblings? Say, yes, I don't have time to list them all. Really? How many in your family? I really can't count them. What do you mean? Well, they're all over the world. Because we're actually a part of God's family. Listen, in Acts chapter 1 and verse 22 to 23, the news about them reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem. And they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. Then when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. When we have close fellowship, we understand what it means to belong to Christ and to one another. This passage describes here that the church, church in Jerusalem had word, heard word from the church at Antioch, and it blessed their heart and encouraged them. Let me ask you something. How many of us are concerned about what's happening at Sunny Bray this morning? And encouraged by what God is doing at Sunny Bray? How many of us are encouraged by the knowledge that we are not simply the children of God only within these walls, but that Hillside Baptist is praising the Lord this morning and reaching out into the community that they might be able to grow in the knowledge of faith and reach people with the gospel of Christ and they're our sister church. I can go through every church in our city, folks, and talk about those that are God-fearing, God-preaching, biblical churches and tell you that they are our brothers and sisters in Christ. Let me ask you something. What happens when you hear they're doing well? Do you feel a little jealous? Do you feel, you see, how about, wait, okay, let's bring it home. Are you happy when God is doing something good in our churches? Listen to this. churches this weekend, and, uh, and, and one of the, the exciting things that happened is a Third Day Grace Church, the new congregation in uh, North Sydney, was just voted in as a brand new uh, CBAC church um, this weekend, and so that's an exciting thing to have one of our church plants that was just, uh, we've, we've grown the family, and one of those churches uh, extended a welcome into that association, was, was uh, made for a great weekend, and, and, and then I had an opportunity to, to speak on Sunday to the Clyde Avenue Baptist Church, and uh, they're a small church that's been partnering with Third Day Grace Church, and uh, you know, I always say it's not the size of the church, it's the size of the leader, and, and there's a small church that has caught a vision for how they can partner with Third Day, and God's doing some great things um, in, in North Sydney. I, I also had a chance with Brian Barron to, to tour their brand new building. Uh, they're just acquiring this new old school, about 10,000 square feet, and, uh, and so I had a chance to go through that with him, and uh, there's so much potential for that facility uh, to reach out to the, mainly to the young people of North Sydney, and uh, we're excited about what's going on. You see, folks, when we have close fellowship, it doesn't mean just inside the walls of Highfield Baptist Church, but it means that we have close fellowship with people all around the Maritimes who are worshiping and praising the Lord and seeking to make his name known. That was Kevin Vincent. He works for our Canadian Baptist of Atlanta, Canada head office. And he's a part of me reaching out and making more churches in Atlanta, Canada. And they've been very uh, instrumental in the part of bringing the doors here to our church that we might reach out to internationals and refugees. Folks, it is a good thing to be a part of God's family and do ministry. Um, when you think about that video, I remember um, some of them saying about Jesus, they're saying, you know, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Well, when you hear about the fact that there will be a new church in Cape Breton, then you wonder, can anything good come out of Cape Breton? <laughs> I'm, okay. I'm allowed to say that, but I'm from Cape Breton. Romans chapter 12, verse 15 says, be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who are weak. What happens in your heart when you hear about another believer in Christ? who's had a great opportunity for success. What happens in our hearts when you hear about another believer in Christ who's had the privilege to travel and you've always wanted to travel, but you haven't been afforded the opportunity? 
What happens in your life when you see a believer in Jesus Christ being given prominence in a new position, and you kind of, in some ways, maybe would have liked to have that position? What happens? Because close fellowship actually is encouraged by the fact that God's people are being blessed by himself, and he chooses whom he sets up and who he tears down. It is a good thing to be a part of God's people. Listen, let me ask you something. Have you ever seen the athlete who takes all the glory for himself? Now, I'm not saying this is the case for this individual, but he's here in cup just by himself. But I'd much prefer to see the second picture. And this is how I see us as a church. That is the team together saying, praise the Lord, God is doing something miraculous in our midst. And that is a good work to be a part of. And that's part of what it is to be have close fellowship, is to be encouraged when God is doing something in, in people's lives. Listen, we're on the winning team. Did you know that? Yeah. Amen. We've been washed clean by the blood of Christ. We are clothed in his righteousness. We are sealed with his Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. We are taught and directed by the Holy Spirit's power. And we are promised eternal glory with the Lord. You can't lose if you're in the family of God. We might as well celebrate one another. And thank God for blessing whoever it is might be in our midst. We are joint heirs to the riches that belong to Jesus. We are grafted into the family of God, which means we become a part of the tree. If you're grafted into the tree, then your branch becomes part of the tree. So you can't tell the difference between what branch was grafted in and what was the original. We actually are all part of one. In Psalm 103, it says, He forgives all my sins. He heals my distresses. He redeems me from death. He crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord gives righteousness and justice to all who are treated unfairly. He reveals his character uh, to Moses and his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and merciful. He's slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us, nor does he remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all our sins, nor does he deal harshly with us as we deserve. His love is unfailing towards those who fear him. As great as the height of the heavens above the earth, he has removed our sins from us. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate. But the love of the Lord remains forever with those who fear him. His salvation extends to all children, of those who are faithful to his covenant. Folks, we have this wonderful privilege of being part of the family of God, and it brings to us koinonia. It brings to us a sense of fellowship that is deep, that is connected, that is participant. participant. This close fellowship is part of what it means to love people. Secondly, close fellowship means that there's to be comfort found from knowing and sharing the love of Christ. Therefore, if or since there is encouragement in Christ, and since there is comfort of love, there's comfort in knowing that I'm loved. There is a comfort in knowing that I'm loved. Love is not an island. It's not, it is community. And it is intimacy. Love is practical, and sometimes it's irrational. It is selected in the mind and produced in the heart. It is alive, and when thought to be dead, can be resurrected. One thing that love can never be is alone. For there, by itself alone, it is extinct. It's non-existent. It is the place of no love. It is a void and it is a vacuum. But our love is never alone for God loves us and we love Him. Since we are the focus of God's love and He is the center of our love, then we naturally become the object of each other's love. We cannot love God without loving one another. You've been around a church for a while? <laughs> You've been around a church for a while? Yes? 
you have probably been hurt. Most everybody I bring through a new membership class, I'll tell them, this is what God's people are to do for you. But just remember, somewhere along the line, you're probably going to get hurt by one of God's people. You say, well, that's an awful introduction to a church. But I want to be realistic. I'm not saying it because we're awful people. I'm saying it because we're finite people. Because we make mistakes and sometimes we do things that actually hurt one another. But in the process of being hurt, understand that we can still love one another through the hurt. For love breaks down walls and it builds, it builds back bridges. Maybe you're thinking right now of somebody who's hurt you. Maybe they profess the name of Christ. Brother or sister in Christ. The love of God means when we say we're going to love God, it means that we have to love people. And if we have to love, to love people, we have to have a sense of wanting to have close fellowship with people. But when that is broken or there's some issue there, we also have to understand that there is a comfort in knowing that God can love them through us. And that He never changes His love for us. Folks, what is it like to belong to a church that loves like that? You say, that's hard to do. Yes, it's hard to do. If you don't understand my hurt, you're probably right. I have my own. The only way that I can love people is by loving God more so that He fills through me that I can love them even when they do something wrong. That's why Jesus on the cross stands and looks down and he says, Forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And my heart cries sometimes because I say, Lord God, what have I done with him? And then I say, well, I don't know who it is, but I want to love them with my whole heart. It's what we ought to be characterized by. They will know us. They will know us by our love. And I'll tell you right now, folks, if we develop a church whose one of the core values of our church is that we love people unconditionally, we will have the opportunity to reach far beyond we ever could expect because there's not a lot of unconditional love, sometimes not even in churches. Paul Tripp pastor and author, writes 23 different ideas about love. And I didn't write all 23 down, but if you Google this 23 things that love is by Paul Tripp, you can read them, and they're good, but I'm going to read a few for you. Listen to them. Love is actually fighting the temptation to be critical and judgmental toward others while looking for ways to encourage and praise. Love is being more committed to unity and understanding that you are winning, accusing, or being right. <laughs> oh, Rachel, I used to do this skit on marriage retreats. And we used to say, do you want to be right or do you want to love? Because sometimes, you know, here's the thing. In a marriage relationship and in church relationships, if one person ends up being right and wins, nobody wins. If you're a husband, you understand that. <laughs> if we love, everybody wins. Love is making a daily commitment to grow in love so that you love, the love you offer to one another is increasingly selfless, mature, and patient. Love is being willing to invest the time necessary to discuss Examine and understand the relational problems that you are facing. Stay on task until the problem is removed or you have agreed upon a strategy of response. Love is speaking kindly and gently even in moments of disagreement, refusing to attack the other person's character or assaulting their intelligence. <laughs> yeah. Rachel and I have a little disagreement this week. <clears throat> She's not here, so I can share it. <laughs> I won. No, I'm just joking. We love, so we win. We won together. We had a little disagreement. You know those days where you're really tired and you're not seeing eye to eye, and you come in and you just kind of are in the mood for a fight. It would almost actually feel good just to get the tension in a little bit. But we've been married 23, 24 years actually. Don't come up 25. And we determined that we want to have less fights, so less frequent between fights, and less intense when we have. And we're working on that. 
And I was, she downstairs, and I brought something up, and she didn't really like the fact that I brought it up, so she went upstairs. Then I decided rather than give her five minutes, I'd walk with her. <laughs> and I'm walking up the stairs going, I don't know if this is a good idea or not. <laughs> We're in the room and we're having this conversation, and all of a sudden, somewhere along in the midst of the conversation, it's not too overly heated, but it's, you know, intense. You know, the tension there that you can kind of cut with a knife. And I'm like, I'm like, we don't want to do this, do we? She's like, well, I'm like, you know what we probably should do? We probably should go for a walk. So I don't want to spend any time with you right now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Speaking kindly and gently, even in moments of disagreement, refusing to attack the other person's character or assault their intelligence. So, somewhere along the talk, I said to her, I said, You know what? I think I remember something that we did when we were teaching other people how to do their marriages better. Maybe we should put it in practice. I said, That is the enemy. This issue. We are the enemy. We're on the same team. That's the enemy. And all of a sudden, we started to change our, our, our conversation, and we started to deal with the issue rather than actually making an issue between the two of us and creating an issue with starting to talk about each other's character or who has more stamina and who's, who's in a better frame of mind to actually have a conversation or whatever else it might be. Listen, love is staying faithful to your commitment to treat one another with appreciation, respect, and grace even in moments when the other person doesn't seem deserving <laughs> or is unwilling to reciprocate. Love is daily admitting to yourself, the other person, and God that you are unable to, to be driven by a cruciform, or sorry, you are unable to be driven by a cruciform love that God's pro protecting, providing, forgiving, rescuing, and delivering grace. You just remember that love is impossible with God's grace. That would be Here's the thing, you see, we could talk about all kinds of things about loving people in church and kind of make it sound really cool, and y'all go out of here going, whew, yeah. But this is the nitty gritty. This is actually doing it. This is the hard part, right? And you remember that I have two feet, two arms, a brain, and I sweat when I work out too hard, which means I'm human. Which means that when I come towards you, there's going to be times where my humanity comes out, and you're going to have to love me anyway. And just in case you didn't know, you have two feet, two hands, and you sweat too. And when you come towards me, somewhere along the line, I've got to learn how to love you in your humanity. And it's not always easy, but it's one of the things that makes a church distinguishable with regards to the fact that we're going to say that our main commitments in this church is to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind. He gave his son for the life of the church. And he loved him that much that he walked the dirty roads, he sweat in his body, and he laid it down that we might be saved, saved, saved. And so, folks, if we don't love one another with the same commitment that he loves us, we're at a loss. So we have to love. We have to love. And when we lay down at the foot of the cross and we die to self, he empowers us to love beyond what we thought we were capable of. But you can't do it by yourself. Number three, and I'm almost done. Close fellowship means that there is fellowship together in the Spirit of God. I mentioned before that the Greek word for fellowship is koinonia. It means connection, participation, association in a close and intimate way. Some say that blood is thicker than... Right. But the idea here is that the Spirit is thicker than blood. It's the idea that the blood of Jesus is thicker than the blood of even your own physical family. I'm not trying to be offensive, but I am trying to be truthful to Scripture. The blood of God's relationship with you and with one another in this fellowship is even that thicker than our own physical families. That is exactly what took place in the lives of people who came to faith in Christ and became known as people of the way in the New Testament. Because when they accepted Jesus as the Messiah, they were immediately cut off from their families. Some Jewish families even had funeral services for their loved one who gave their life to Christ and became a follower of Christ. They were dead to them. And so their whole family became the church. 
They were interdependent upon one another and they loved one another with one another because they had nobody else in this world. You remember that last week we had Besma, Besma Dabar. She came from the Voice of the Martyrs and she spoke to us for a few moments. And afterwards I had a chance to go out with her for, for a meal. And we sat down and we talked about the ministry of Voice of the Martyrs. And we talked a little bit about her life. And she's come to Canada from a foreign country. She has no family or relatives in Canada. And she has had to learn what it is to have a church to become her family in a, in a way which we don't seem to understand lots of times. And I say me too because I got family. Good friends of ours from the East Coast here uh, came to faith in Jesus Christ out of the, out of the Catholic Church and began to, to, to be involved in ministry there. And out of that situation, they came there and their family disowned them. No, not every family does. That was in this all hope because all says, and I don't want to say that, but their family did. And they became so intimately connected. And they used to say to me, Pastor, you don't know what it means to us when somebody comes over to our place for Thanksgiving dinner from the church, because that has become our family. I want to tell you folks, that if we're going to love people the way we ought to love people, we have to look at each other, not just as church members, not just as people that come to church together so often, not just people worship together, but actually brothers and sisters in Christ. When the blood of Christ becomes thicker than the blood of physical birth. Pretty significant stuff. Wow, look at that. I went through a whole page of notes and didn't look at it. I think that's what happened to the Apostle Paul, right? When he became a convert to Christianity. See, Paul, it says that he had the best upbringing. He had the best teachers. He was going to be a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Think about what his parents thought, his Jewish moms and dads. Did you see our son Paul? Boom, he's going to be a cool guy. He's going to be a leader. He's going to be one of the people who has the authority. He's going to be this, 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 this. He was on his way. And all of a sudden, he comes to faith in Jesus Christ, and everything changes. And you never hear anything about Paul's life outside of the church. Why? Because it became his entire family <laughs> in his life. We are called to love people. And we need to do it through close fellowship, compassionate ministry, a passion for evangelism. We're going to talk about compassion and ministry next week. But how is your fellowship with God's people? You know, they say people that have pets. How many of you in here have a pet? Yeah, we have two gold retrievers. And they say that people that have pets sometimes start to look like their pet. <laughs> do you ever see that? They do. I don't know. I think the one down from, from my direction, is it's down bottom left-hand corner, I think they're probably the closest. Like, the hair is almost identical, right? It's amazing. Yeah. So, so the question is this, that do we hang around each other enough to start to look like one another? Do we hang around each other enough and with Christ enough that we start to look like Christ? Like, if I really hang with my dogs as much as these people do, <laughs> y'all are in for trouble. Because I don't want to come in looking like a golden retriever. <laughs> but I do want to look like Jesus. And I wonder if I hang out with him and with God's people more than I hang out with anybody else, what I might start to look like. You see... In first year, second Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14, it says, Don't team up with those who are unbelievers. How can righteousness become a partner with wickedness? And how can light live in darkness? Ephesians 5.11, it says, We have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Who do you want to look like? Because depending on who you hang around with, the chances are you're going to look like them. We're going to love God and we're going to love people. That's going to be our theme. That's going to be our model. You're going to hear it said a lot. We're going to love God and we're going to love people. And we want to give you an opportunity to have close fellowship, 
by giving multi-generational and multi-ethnic opportunities for you to connect. So that you can come out to Young at Heart, you can come to our adult fellowship group, you can come into our young people's program, we can have certain events that we do all together as a church. And I want to encourage you, get involved. Take time out of your day. You will be surprised at what it means when you take time out of your day to be a part and actively involved in God's people and with God's people. We want to give multi-ethnic opportunities. So we've had many times that we've had international suppers. I hope that you've taken a chance to be there. This is a great time. And we learn so much from different people in different walks of life. And we want to enable a relational connectivity. We want to enable an opportunity for you to relationally connect. And so if we make opportunities, that's our job. But your job, if we're going to build close fellowship, is to take advantage of those opportunities. Your job is to be a part. To connect, to walk across and meet somebody you've never met before. You say, I'm an introvert, okay? You sit there long enough with a sign that says, I'm introvert. Somebody looks at you. <laughs> but connect in some way. Because we are stronger together than we ever possibly could be by ourselves. Let's pray, shall we? Father God, we want to thank you today for your love for us. And we are learning every step of the way. Not one of us have made it. In fact, not one of us can get close to that meeting. But we do believe that if we walk in the Spirit as He is in the Spirit, then we will have fellowship with God and with one another. And we believe that fellowship is important and you've told us that it is. And so, Lord, we want to love you and we want to love people. And one of the ways we want to do that so well is through building fellowship with so we cry together and we laugh together. We weep together and we pray together and we rejoice together and we praise together. Because we are the church. We are your bride. We are the family of God. And you connect us all through the person of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, maybe there's somebody here this morning who feels very far outside. Maybe it's because there's something in their life that they need to come and confess before you today. Would you convict their heart right now? And when they see that conviction as a gift from you rather than rebellion, when they say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for pointing that out in my life. Help me not to hold on to it, but to lay it down. Forgive me for that sin and help me to walk in faithfulness before you. God, I pray that you would work in somebody's life here today who maybe have never put their faith and trust in Christ at all. They're saying, I want to be a part of the family of God. Lord Jesus, would you come into my life, forgive me for my sin, you my Lord and my Savior. And today, you may be born again into a new family. Thank you for the privilege of allowing us to be a part of your kingdom building. Be with our sister churches within the city, around the province, around the Maritimes, around the world. They might preach the truth of the gospel. Be very clear about the intent and understand scripture and live it out that we might be a light to the world. For we know that the church is the hope of the world. May we love you and love others with all our heart. In Christ's name, amen. Our team, come please and close our service together as we conclude our worship. share a song with you called You Found Me, and uh, I've also spent some time at Harvest House. I worked there for uh, about a year, and um, this song talks about the story of a gentleman that arrived at the doorsteps of Harvest House. He doesn't know how he landed there. Um, his life was completely broken, and he had been dealing with addictions, and, um, but God found him. And in Luke 15, it talks about the shepherd that had the 99 sheep, and one was lost. And he left the 99 sheep to go find the one that was lost. And so that Pastor Greg spoke about this morning, that God first loved us, that he first found us. And so out of a response of love to him, uh, we can love him, we can love one another. Amen? The song is called You Found Me.
Florida. I believe that our hearts have probably been touched. Hopefully your lunch isn't burnt. If it, if it is, blame me. And if it's really burnt, like really burnt, I'll take you out for lunch. But you got to call me and I've got to see the evidence. Right, let's pray, shall we? God, I want to thank you so much for your love. Lord, your spirit ministers to our hearts in ways in which we don't even know. Maybe there's somebody here this morning whose heart is hurting. Maybe they haven't told anybody, not even their spouse or their friend. I pray that your ministry will touch them in a vital way. And a little healing will occur. Thank you, Lord, for your love for us today. Thank you that you call us to the close fellowship and that in many ways we already enjoy it. But may we seek it even deeper and hold one another in prayer and hold one another up for concern and love. Father, I pray that we will make a concerted effort of building relationships with one another and giving each other room to grow and practice what it is to try to do the virtues of the kingdom with mercy and grace and forgiveness and then make mistakes and forgive one another and just try again. Not be impatient with Make this a place where we can grow and have the opportunity to be all that we can be in Christ. Now, Lord, I pray your blessing upon each person here today. I pray for Martine, Justin, and their family, that you might guide them in their ministry and their daily work environment. I pray that your light of your spirit might shine upon us and grant us grace and mercy and peace, both today and each day that we meet together again. In Christ's name. Folks, just a couple things to remind you of. Don't forget about our video series tonight. Uh, today is the, or the case for design. If you want to be here, it's a great video series. Also, Martine has some CDs and, and some information available in the gymnasium. If you're interested in having one, just head that direction and get one there. God bless you. We'll see you tonight.